In the following talk, we will take a closer look at the underlying structure of GaiaX, the five GaiaX basic principles for data exchange. We want to give you answers to question as, what is GaiaX standing for? What kind of values and principles lie behind? And what will you get out of it? I'm happy to hand over now for this talk to, from Dortmund, Mr. Professor Boris Otto, Executive Director Fraunhofer Institute for Software and Systems and Interim CTO of Gaia XAISBL. From Paris, Mr. Alban Schmutz, Senior Vice President Public Affairs, OVH Cloud, Interim Deputy CTO of Gaia XAISBL. And from Cologne, Mr. Andreas Weiss, Head of Digital Business Models, Eco Association of the Internet. Gentlemen, it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carmen, for the kind introduction. Um, yes, as you said, I mean, it's absolutely right. Gaia X, of course, is not an end in itself, but it is rather an enabler of business, of business value, of business innovation. That's clear. And I would like to stress this point a little bit because when we talk about um, business innovation in the digital world um, that mainly rests on two things right and we have heard that earlier today uh, on the one hand side of course it's cool services that people want to use right but on the other hand this is the second side of the same coin it's it's data right so that is the major pillar on which business innovation rests today so when we talk about data and we take a company perspective for example um, then we usually find that we have to categorize three different groups of data so first of all it's your own data so private data you you need to have your own data in good shape what is often also not that easy to say it like that but then we need to combine it with um, data from business partners that you usually know well, for example, in value chains and something like that. But you also need to combine that with context information, like weather or traffic information. And um, sometimes these categories are referred to like private data goods that you own yourselves or club goods, which are in a community like a supply network, for example, and open data. Um, a good example for, for that can be found in, in logistics. It's a very well-known and proven service, which is called um, um, estimated time of arrival services. And usually, um, uh, logistics service providers offer these estimated time of arrival services in order to help um, the, the recipients of a transport good to better plan the operations, for example. Um, and of course, they should tell um, the recipient of the good um, an arrival time that is as accurate as possible, of course. So as I said, they can do their planning and resource assignment uh, accordingly. But for the logistics service provider to offer this service, um, they need a bunch of information, of course, to do that. Um, for example, information about the transport orders, um, the carrier who's actually carrying out the transport order, so that the truck driver in, in, the, in, in the end, um, data about the customer, so it's master data, so where it's located and the customer um, order and stuff like that, but also the unloading place, so the location where the stuff has to be put. Then as well, of course, the position of the carrier um, at a certain moment in time, um, including also traffic information where it is right now, but also let's say where the tra like about the traffic um, um, uh, situation at the place of arrival of the goods. And of course, the, the entire context information when it comes to traffic along the way from the current uh, location of the uh, carrier to uh, basically the final destination. And we can see in this easy example that has become a commodity, so to say, that um, uh, basically uh, lots of different uh, kinds of information stemming from different sources need to be brought together. And we also see, and that is also important and has been um, noted earlier today, um, that these kind of services are not offered on a bilateral basis any longer, but literally in networks, for example, in supply networks. So thus, ecosystems are formed to generate business uh, innovation, um, which basically um, form a multilateral form of organizing for a joint innovation. And we will see great examples later on today in the afternoon. Um, but what is the matter of fact often is that in these ecosystems, um, no single player has all the data, as we've just learned in the logistics example, uh, to create this innovative data-driven service. So nobody, no one, no single uh, member of an ecosystem has all what it needs uh, to do and to offer this service. That's what we need to do is basically that we need to bring uh, data together 
but without forcing the individual partners in these ecosystems to dump their data into a central data lake where they can't execute any control, of course. So in short, what we want to do, and that is basically also what we want to do in Gaia, we want to create data spaces where the data is exchanged on a bilateral uh, basis between partners themselves. Or, for example, where we... Um, where we leave the data where it is and just exchange the algorithms to perform certain services and analysis on them. Um, in addition to that, I mean, if we also share um, valuable data or let's say sensitive information, remember the, the estimated time of arrival example, we of course have a location of the truck driver, right? So it's personal information in the end. So what we want to make sure in that case is that we of course can trust each other so that we can trust the partners in the ecosystems and of course, that the data providers can also stay in control over who is allowed to do what with the data shared. Um, so what we need in order to do that and to achieve this, let's say, infrastructure for innovation, as it was also phrased earlier on, we need, of course, interoperability of the data. That is a key prerequisite because we want to have it automated, right? We want to have sovereignty over the data so i want to be in control if i'm a data provider and of course we want to have trust among the participants so i really want to uh, be sure that the other one who is requesting my data is really the one uh, who pretends himself to be so this is what gaia x is actually about so it addresses the concrete uh, issue a challenge that we have to overcome if we want to leverage innovative uh, scenarios. Um, Gaia sets the standard for a federated data infrastructure. And the nice thing with that is that we do not altogether have to basically reinvent the wheel. So it will not be the case that we sit down and with a blank sheet of paper and start, okay, how could this architecture look like that allows us to, to implement this infrastructure? But rather, what we want to do is um, reuse as much of the good things and good investments that are already existing. So we want to create an architecture of standards rather, as I said, than to start from scratch again. And one good example um, comes from the International Data Spaces Association, um, which developed a reference architecture for data sovereignty. And it's there and we can just use it and build it in into our, into our overall puzzle. Um, important, though, is, however, that data sovereignty and interoperability do not only play a role on, let's say, the, the service layer, the data service layer, if we have, let's say, typical uh, platform architectural stack as in mind. But, of course, it's equally important also on the infrastructure layer. And this is a perfect point in time to hand over the word to Alban, who will outline on that. Okay, can you see me? I'll just put, I'm gonna start. So, uh, thanks, Bo thanks, Boris, for for handing over here. Uh, for uh, those uh, who don't know me, I'm just introducing myself uh, very quickly, uh, so you uh, you know where I'm coming from. So, I'm Alban Schmutz. I'm with Soviet Cloud, which is the largest European cloud provider, and I'm also chairman of CISPE, Cloud Infrastructure Services Provider in Europe. Uh, which, which have members headquartered in 14 European countries, and both are founding members of uh, GaiaX. And what I want to discuss now is um, uh, quickly what is the added value for the cloud providers to be in GaiaX. And I would say first, uh, we have a, share, a shared interest with our customers uh, to structure uh, the European market based on European values. This means openness, transparency, data protection, security, portability, and end of lock-in behaviors. So this is something very, very important that has been outlined in the previous roundtable. Uh, and uh, the question is how, on this first thing, uh, GaiaX is helping. Uh, first, GaiaX already defined what we called policy rules to align these ideas and values and convert them into controllable points. And second, these rules uh, will be put in um, in production and describe 
described within each services that will be declared within the Gaia X. And for example, transparency against non-European extraterritorial regulations uh, or portability of licenses are topic addressed in our work uh, on the top of technical developments. Second, uh, cloud providers are, are facing a series of challenge uh, on their own and uh, being, uh, for example, the speed of growth of the European cloud market enhance trust uh, and avoid, uh, once again, looking uh, to restrain customer choice. Today, only, so uh, um, given a, a study from the European Commission, only 24% uh, of uh, European organizations are using a cloud service. So, uh, and our goal within GaiaX is to help to bring that to 60 or 70% uh, in the next coming years. So, and how are we going to do that within GaiaX? So we'll develop common standards between uh, cloud providers that would accelerate the take up of the market and in the same time enhance portability between pro uh, cloud providers. Uh, GaiaX works uh, also agree on standard and reference uh, implementation of core services uh, that enables each provider uh, basically to, uh, to use it and to onboard easily uh, uh, pro, uh, customers uh, to be able to use various services on the, uh, uh, on the market. And so, for example, this means, uh, I would say, discussing regarding identity and access management or self-description of services. So any cloud provider will benefit of the collective work. And this may, uh, uh, I would say, lead to a better working market there and customers will benefit of a broader market offering and being able to compose their services from uh, from various players i want to have a, a very strong player in a niche market for um, uh, i don't know for healthcare services i will be able to find it but uh, for other uh, for other services i will need to have uh, some other players with different categories or uh, different standards will be met so I will be able to compose them easily and not only to rely on, uh, I would say, one uh, single uh, um, uh, silo of uh, offering uh, within one provider on the market. And this brings me to the third point. I think Europe needs a level playing field for cloud. Uh, and this is beneficial for all cloud providers. So, and we are happy uh, that the European Commission started to work on that. For example, with the free flow of non-personal data regulation and its Article 6 regarding porting of, uh, of non-personal data. So the idea is to be able to move easier, uh, uh, easily from one cloud provider to another. But we need to go further, and we all know this. And for example, the, uh, the future coming Digital Market Act, uh, uh, or part of the Digital Services Act, uh, when it comes to competition uh, that is migrated to another tool, uh, will be tabled very soon by the European Commission. And this will propose ex ante rules, and this has been discussed earlier, uh, uh, especially by uh, 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 by Madame Frison Roche uh, this morning, and uh, and where we have some gatekeeper uh, uh, questions. And cloud is one area where gatekeepers uh, should be uh, identified, and we have to ensure strong limitation or flocking of customers. A second example here is uh, within the European data strategy. Uh, published last February with the European uh, Cloud Rulebook. So the European Commission wants to set a, a set of rules regarding the cloud area. And for all these questions, uh, GaiaX is already on the forefront of the discussion since uh, we have developed what we named, as I mentioned, the policy rules. So a set of rules regarding transparency, openness, uh, data protection, reversibility, uh, and, and others. And it has already been published the, uh, uh, for the first version in the 4th of June. And this will be a pillar of this EU cloud rulebook. So GaiaX is already taking uh, these questions uh, in, in hand. And to summarize, uh, GaiaX is a very powerful endeavor which every cloud provider uh, will find a benefit both on a technical uh, point of view to serve their customers, but also to have a collective approach to bring more value uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to the market uh, in Europe. And know uh, that uh, I described here on what is interest of, uh, I would say, cloud providers in an ecosystem perspective here. I'm happy to hand over to Andreas Weiss, who will discuss uh, towards uh, ecosystem added value for uh, GaiaX. Thank you very much, uh, Bon and Boris, for these insights. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I represent Eco Association of the Internet Industry. 
And we can look back of 25 years of impressive development of the Internet. I think we can all confirm that the use of the Internet is firmly integrated in a wide range of areas of life and business. And the recent development shows that stable and resilient digital infrastructures and services are of great importance. So the potential of using digital technologies that are powered by the Internet, cloud services and data rooms generally holds far reaching economic opportunities. And we see ourselves as being responsible for accompanying the design of GAIAX as an ecosystem for data infrastructures. And um, let me first explain the concept of GAIAX from our perspective. The original goal of GAIAX is the conception of a federated data infrastructure with a focus on data sovereignty and data availability based on European standards and values with the aim of promoting innovation in Europe. It is impressive that more than 300 companies and organizations with over 500 people have already actively participated in the technical design of GAIA-X in a truly short time. Of these, 75% are in private sector, half of which are small and medium-sized enterprises. And here we see the need to integrate our startups and innovative firms into the digital value chain and uh, by this, we envision also a great opportunity for Europe to connect the diversity of competences in the field of infrastructure offerings like data center, edge, cloud, and interconnection, and data rooms with forward-looking, often small companies, and to create an innovation space that is agile, secure, and, of course, in line with European values and EU legislation. So as Boris already mentioned, it is not a matter of reinventing everything, but of bringing together what already exists. <clears throat> this approach does not exclude any actor per se, but sets clear requirements of technical and organizational involvement as outlined by Alban with the policies and rules. I would also like to stress that GAIA-X is a federal concept. This creates a space for self-determination, which we in Europe greatly appreciate. In this sense, the Federation services to be developed as part of GAIA-X are to be developed as open source services. On this basis, user groups can also organize themselves as part of GAIA-X, provided they are conform to the relevant rules. In view of the opportunity to develop more and more cross-domain concepts and to make functional mergers very simple, the advantages of the federal approach taken by GAIA-X are obvious. Ladies and gentlemen, based on our many years of experience in governance, digital infrastructures, and the design of digital business models based on innovative digital technologies, the ECO Association with around 1,100 members from 70 countries will continue to play an intensive role for the further development of GAIA-X. We are totally convinced by the objectives and, uh, of this initiative, as well as by the opportunities and potential that GAIA-X offers to the European economy. And therefore, I would like to thank you for your attention. And yeah, we're going to step now into a more in-depth discussion. And as Carmen already indicated, we are addressing five core principles like policy rules for the European single market, the federated data infrastructure, interoperability, portability, and sovereignty over data. And also one key area is the architecture of standards in conjunction with the internal rules, so which is more our self-governance around GAIA-X. And, and with these introductions, I, I will hand over to Alban, uh, and probably we, we can discuss these topics furthermore. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, and so uh, now we're going to, uh, I would say, ask uh, some uh, great questions here. And I want to start here and um, uh, to ask to Boris. Uh, Boris, you have been uh, deeply working on data exchanges topic, as I think everyone understood in your speech, and uh, even building a strong community with the International Data Space Association on the topic. Could you tell us a bit more on uh, how GAIA-X solve real day-to-day -day issues uh, for industry users uh, of GAIA-X? Yes, um, thanks for the question, Alba, and of course, I'm happy to, to respond to that. Um, as you said, I mean, um, the, the, the major value of GAIA-X will be that it basically um, allows us uh, the definition of tools which makes data sharing easier. 
let's let's call it like that. And I want to like underline that with a with, with an example from a number of projects that I've undergone over the last years, um, trying to understand what to do and helping companies to engage into data spaces and data sharing activities. And my observation is that in the end, that pretty often it's quite clear why data sharing is a good thing, right? Everybody knows that if information is shared, all will be better off. That's the notion of the ecosystem. But there are a couple of things that um, prohibit that, as we have heard earlier on. And Gaia X will come up with, as I said, concrete tools to make that easier. And I want to give three examples. The first thing is that companies are much more willing to share their data if they understand what happened afterwards, right? So basically transparency about what happens with my data after I have shared it is one of the key um, key requirements to embark into a data sharing principle. And in that sense, I do not talk uh, even about, let's say, uh, usage control or let's say determining uh, um, um, a digital uh, using usage rights. It's just about transparency about what's going on after I have shared my information. And that is something that we will allow with Gaia. Second thing is that there are, let's say, in many cases, requirements with regard to sharing, um, well, sensitive information that you usually would not share. So and there you want to execute some sort of control over it. So you want to determine the rules of the game um, according to which the data can be used by third parties. And what we need to define, and that is the great opportunity, but also the urgent need, is, let's say, the, well, the terms and conditions for the data economy. I mean, we're all used to have these terms and conditions for physical stuff that we consume, right? Um, but we don't have it for data. And I just want to attach the usage rights, as I said, the conditions, the terms and conditions for future use to the data when I share it. Um, so that was the second thing. And the third thing, what we will also be able to do um, with, um, with Gaia X to, well, <laughs> allow for something which is in my point of view, very human. If I'm always the one who gives data, but never gets, it's not so funny, right? <laughs> so um, what we want to see is more scenarios in which there is a quid pro quo principle applied. So that data sharing is really something multidirectional and not just from one way or in, in, not in, not just in one direction. So I believe that with these concrete, um, well, enablements, enablers, based on the Gaia X infrastructure, we will make a huge progress in terms of, of sharing data. But when I talked about, uh, let's say, the, the various occasions that I had in order to embark with companies to look into data sharing scenarios, that brings me to the question that I'd like uh, to ask to Andreas. Because Andreas, you have been over the last month a, a, a true evangelist of the entire Gaia idea. And you have talked with so many people, both from Germany, Europe, but also abroad. In, in your opinion, who are the organizations? Who are the ones that really uh, will bring uh, Gaia X forward? So, who, who will be the key contributors, and what, what's your perspective on that, Andreas? Okay, yes, Boris. Well, as we are targeting a huge digital ecosystem, we are all aware to face multiple expectations and requirements. So, having talks to countries, domains, and special interest groups. The challenge is to find um, common requirements and to build a joint functional and technical roadmap from my point of view. So in this sense, we need to take care about reasonable expectation management as well. Talking, for example, with USC, the European Open Science Cloud, it makes sense to address federation of cloud services and to support the establishment of data spaces. But the questions how to organize the science community must be left with these stakeholders. So in my view, the establishment of hubs either by country, domain, or interest group to align with the further development of GAIA-X is a good way to build up synergies on one side, but then leave the very specific requirements with the specialists. So being blunt, GAIA-X cannot solve everyone's problem, but can address key problems in terms of interoperability, scalability, and fair data sharing with European-flavored compliance considerations. And I think this is really where we, we, where we need this combination of the data ecosystem with the infrastructure system. And, uh, uh, and we need, of course, a reasonable level of choice and even more the integration of our European provider economy in the overall value network. 
So and saying this, this leads me to a question to Alban. Uh, Alban, the cloud market is often seen as an area with only a few players dominate the market. And we have all this hyperscaler discussion. But how do you see that GaiaX may contribute to bring a different path on the table? I think this is a very good question, uh, Andreas. So thanks for, thanks for asking. Um, since um, I think that uh, the um, European pass is not about having a uh, few numbers of big players, but it's rather to build on the multitude of, uh, I would say, the ecosystem in Europe. Uh, but, this, uh, but this means also uh, working with them where possible. So, but all together, um, uh, GaiaX is making this possible. Today, we announced that GaiaX is more than 180 organizations that are member of, uh, uh, of the group. And all together, we will work on the same path regarding bringing the European values on the table. And so we will be able to address the questions of, uh, I would say, giving uh, back the bargaining power to, uh, to, to customers and to have them uh, the right to choose any of the provider there that, that they want to, to, to use whatever their, I would say, the level in the stack. So I think this is something very important. And on the day to day, today, uh, we already see that many competitors are working together to make this possible. And, uh, and uh, the community today is already, I would say, very active to develop, I would say, uh, and to agree on standards, to, de to develop technical paths to do so. And I'm pretty sure that this is a way to, 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 to bring this uh, life. And, and I would even say it's beyond Europe. So all the questions we are discussing here in the European perspective are pretty the same if you are in Australia or in South America. Uh, so I think with GaiaX, we are paving the way today of something broader than Europe. And I think this is really great to, uh, for, for that. Uh, but I want like to, to, ask, uh, uh, to ask another question to Boris. Uh, looking at uh, the GaiaX association, what are the key deliverables, deliverables for you uh, that will make GaiaX, uh, uh, I would say, value proposition coming to life? How, it, how, is, it, how is it working? Yeah, that's also, of course a very important point that you make, Alban, because um, as Andreas also mentioned, I mean, expectations are enormous and um, high and which is good. And also the, let's say the opportunity is, is right now, right? But of course, the association cannot basically do everything on its own. But therefore, it's important to understand what the association can actually deliver. And uh, in my point of view, um, we together, as the Gaia X Association, should focus on, on on three things. The first thing is that we need to, well, we need to write a Gaia X architecture document, right? We, if we set or aim at setting a standard for a federated data infrastructure, we need to write down how this should look like. And um, there can only be, of course, one architecture uh, document that must be clear. Um, in this architecture document, um, it is necessary that, as you said, Alban, we refer to the architecture of standards. So do not we, that we do not reinvent everything from scratch again, because that wouldn't make sense and also would cost too much time. But we need, um, as I said, the Gaia X architecture to be defined. First thing. The second thing is, um, in the past, I mean, that was nice, right? People wrote architecture documents and then they put them on the website or even behind a paywall and uh, were hoping to basically um, the community to take it up. Um, and what we have learned all together, of course, over the last years is that this model will probably not work. And that is something that we also have touched upon briefly. We also need to have um, an implementation of the fundamental uh, things of GaiaX, the federation services. So we need to have an open source implementation of the fundamental federation services that we need in order to bring uh, GaiaX to life. Why is that important? And it has also briefly mentioned, but I'd like to stress this once more. First thing is, well, open source is a, well, it's a sort of trust anchor per se, right? Because I can look into the code. I know what's going on, right? And that is open for everybody to see. The next thing, talking about everybody, um, I think that we have right now 
really and andreas you mentioned that when you refer to the to the multitude of people that have already um contributed to gaia x um we have uh, once in a decade perhaps even longer time frames uh, opportunity to build something together and that is something which is 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 really great so we need to also well encourage uh, people to contribute and um, i truly believe in the open source paradigm in this um, in this context when we refer to this federation services which form the fundamental um, services that are needed in to order to bring gaia to life so this was the second thing so first we need to have write an architecture document second we need to have an open source implementation of it however if we have an open source implementation we also need in order to basically also uh, live up with the promise that we made to create trust and data sovereignty we also need to have a mechanism in place that is able to tell good from bad you know if i may call it like that so we need to have something in place that tells us whether this service that um, pretends to comply with gaia x actually does that right so we need to have validation procedures in place and also we might end up with some sort of certification in order to say okay this guy is basically using the Gaia X logo and he says he is Gaia X um, conformant. So and that is really the case. We need to somehow prove that. So those are the three things, I believe, um, that are core in terms of deliverables um, of the association. Uh, the good thing is with three things, that's a manageable list of things that we want to work on. Um, I, I'm very positive that we will be able to do that. Why? Well, it's really a strong momentum that we have, right? Um, we can, and that was mentioned by Carmen in the very, very beginning of the summit um, earlier today. She said it's from the community for the community, and that's really true. So we all together, basically, with equal rights, determine the rules of the game according to which we want to play. It's no single um, company, no single player, also no single government that tells us how it should look like. It's us, right? And that's that's very powerful. Um, when I talked about, let's say, the association, um, and of course, um, we have great commitment from, from many stakeholder groups, and this is, as I said, a great thing to see. Of course, you, we always all together ask ourselves the question, okay, how, how should we do that and what would be next steps? And that would be my question to Andreas, because um, we can be very lucky to have people like Andreas on board, because he he is heading, has been heading a large industry association for, for decades and, and made that a success. Um, in, in fact, ECO, the the association of the internet and andreas the question to you would be well looking back um for let's say the development of eco what would be the success factors the, the the most important success factors that you would basically propose to all of us uh to follow in order to to succeed and to deliver on our promise okay boris well you know this is a very difficult question First of all, there is no blueprint uh, for Gaia-X. And in this sense, we all need to be agile and cannot establish immediately a fixed roadmap. Looking back to the start of ECHO 25 years ago, the kickoff was done to support the peering of three internet providers who are in competition, but they understood to cooperate at this, at this level to move forward with their key business. Now with Dekix in Frankfurt as largest commercial internet exchange, the team manages already thousands of networks worldwide. So one of the success factors is a clear scoping on the core services and to leave the rest with the market. So we need yeah, this separation of duties, who is responsible for what, and this will also lead to our policies and rules and architectural standards and whatever is uh, is, is, is a key deliverable of uh, uh, of Gaia-X, uh, especially also uh, the functional level of the Federation services. Um, additionally, we are driving the high-level topics which are of relevance to build up a common understanding and to act as a voice for the digital industry. And this is something which is also in uh, a role of Gaia-X to bring people together, to, to, to drive this multi-stakeholder management, but always be very clear well, this is my part and this is your part, but then we have to interact and we have to streamline and we have to align our roadmaps and then we are moving forward together because this is really, we need to move forward together with the market. Um, and uh, 
This can only work with particip participation of all the, the major governance activities, which is of relevance for the economy, but even more for the overall society. But we, we, this is really something we have to take into consideration, uh, that there's a huge responsibility to, to move forward with GAIA-X. Um, and when we turn into this into the use case discussions we had within GAIA-X, I, I have also a question to Alban. In the, in the platform economy, there is often made a difference between the consumer and the business realm. What do you think? Don't Do we see the same market developments in the B2B segment as we have experienced in the consumer segment? Thanks, Andreas, for the questions. Uh, I, I think that um, so we on the B2B market today, uh, we are in a, in a platform market as well. So I think any, uh, I would say, company today see itself I would say, as, a, um, uh, as, as a platform uh, to serve customers. And uh, it's something very, very strong today. And uh, we have to learn from what happened on the B2C market, on the B2B market. And uh, when I previously referred to uh, some new regulations uh, uh, with ex ante rules that are coming to the table, I think this is interesting to, to see that uh, rules that have been uh, sought, uh, I would say, since the beginning uh, for, I would say, B2C markets like, uh, um, I would say, uh, um, commons of goods or, uh, or social media, I know, okay, we have to think as well as um, behaviors uh, on uh, on the, uh, I would say, the B2B market as well. And for example, uh, coming from, I would say, the software area uh, market where we had some uh, kind of behaviors from uh, for years or for decades even, and coming now into uh, into the cloud. And uh, so all these consequences, all this continuum is very interesting to 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 see. And uh, we are seeing the same kind of developments. And I'm really uh, happy that Gaia X is coming now, since I think we are in the moment of um, uh, in the progression of the market where we can do things uh, the right way. And doing things the right way now is something very important. And uh, doing it all together, and you mentioned it, I think is something really, really key for all of us. Uh, but I think we are over time regarding this discussion now. And I, uh, I'd like to hand over uh, to, uh, to Carmen for the Q&A session uh, to give the ability uh, to, uh, to the audience also to raise questions for us. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to join your conversation, gentlemen. So I'll thank you also very much for this vivid conversation to uh, Boris Alban et Andreas. And uh, good news, we have uh, we received a lot of questions here in the um, Q&A session. So let's start, okay? Are you ready? Let's have a look for the Are first we? one. How can we implement federated trust, data discovery services and consumption protocols when the recipient, service customer, can map and adjust accordingly? What do you think? Well, well there's uh, Andreas, please start. Yeah. Okay, in, in terms uh, of the federation services, well, within this core we have a couple of areas of it to address. One is the identity management. So we need a clear understanding about the identities. And these are not just human identities, but also systems and, and processes need identities because we need to combine them with their, uh, with their access roads and further on. Um, and this is then seen in conjunction with trust over IP, uh, which means when we establish end-to-end -end connections or also the transfer of data, for example, it must, must be done in a trustworthy manner and uh, just on the communication line, but also in conjunction with appropriate policies and rules, how to manage this interaction. And uh, this brings us then to to a list of services who are following these rules, which are who are in compliance with these requirements. Um, and of course, you, you need also a contractual framework around it. So uh, turning uh, such policies in, uh, and rules into, into model clauses would also help the market to be very clear how to interact, because this is one of the huge problems of the consumer side. Who is finally responsible? Who is in charge? Who is my counterpart? Uh, when we are on the other side facing a, a multiple provider supply chain or even supply network. So this is one of the problems we have to address with the Federation services to 
address the compliance requirements, for example, being compliant with GDPR, being aligned with EU Cybersecurity Act, taking the recommendations out of EIDAS and all these standards which are here applicable. But probably, Boris, you would like to add something as well. Yeah, I wanted to make a point on the data service level um, because what we want to have is basically also, as I said earlier on, transparency about the data transactions. Therefore, I think in the federation services, we need also to foresee that these transactions can be locked. Um, that does not, of course, mean that the payload data is, 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 is monitored or locked or written or, or read. But let's say we need to proof point that the transaction has been um, um, performed according to the rules. And also we need to have a proof point, okay, um, the recipient of my data has uh, received not only the data, but also the, the usage rights, these terms and conditions that I meant, right? In order to really have a proof, okay, he should know what he's allowed to do um, with my data. And we can then further, in a further stage, even think of, let's say, being able to, um, to, to enforce these rights even remotely. And maybe one one thing we sh uh, we should add also regarding this to uh, regarding the I would say the overall trust um, in in the, in the transactions um, inside the AI. So uh, adding something to address what uh, to Andreas said is that all um, the um, things we are looking at the policy rules, for example, to implement will be um, will be controlled and against I would say existing frameworks. That could be uh, codes of conduct or, uh, or um, I would say, our certification frameworks, and we will bring the value of third-party uh, uh, audits results inside, uh, I would say, the Gaia X framework to control the achievement of uh, of these points of control. This is the first thing, and the second thing, uh, what we are, uh, I would say, uh, thinking of as well, is to have a peer-to-peer -peer approach between providers to be able to uh, enhance uh, uh, the level of trust between services, even through between competitors, to ensure that uh, I would say the level of proof uh, will be uh, at the at the highest point in, in inside the value chain for the users in the end. Thank you. Next question: Is there a list of already existing and planned national Gaia X hubs? I think yes. So Who wants yes. to pick this question? Uh, Maybe uh, I, I can start here, and uh, so there, there are already plans. Uh, so they will be presented uh, during these two days. So uh, you, you will discover some of them. Uh, so Germany, France, Italy, uh, Netherlands, and others will be uh, will be uh, will, will be there. So uh, and uh, so and my message here would be also to all the members that uh, it will be really great uh, for those who don't have a national hub today. Uh, to uh, to join and uh, come back to us uh, and help us to build the national hubs in their area. So perhaps to, to add on mm -hmm. that from my side, <clears throat> as you might know from the International Data Spaces Association, we maintain a network of, I believe right now, nine or ten hubs. And uh, they, of course, are, of course, eager also to uh, to to, uh, to play a role um, as a Gaia, a Gaia X hub. Um, I should say that, let's say, and that is also the beauty of it, that let's say what the hubs should do, like being, let's say, uh, a contact point on a national level, but also driving forward um, adoption of Gaia in, in certain domains, um, that this is, um, of course, consistent, but the way how it's implemented pretty much um, depends on the individual country. And that's also a nice thing. So it, in some occasions, it's run by a, a applied research organizations. In others, it's run by an, an industry association. Um, so everybody who is basically having the idea of forming a hub, please reach out to us and then let's see which template, so to say, fits best. Question. So, uh, huh. We have a lot of questions here. If we need uh, data from many sources, as in your ETA example, yeah. this is a question for Boris Otto. How can yeah. IDSA's bilateral data sharing model work? Do we also need a data collective? What do you think? Well, <coughs> I will outline a little bit, um, I think, later today what actually a data space is. And in the end, it's basically. Uh, a network of um, 
of, of data endpoints which follow the same rules. And I say that, that of course we have bilateral exchanges as mentioned in the ETA example, but we will also have, let's say like um, data aggregators, so to say that, um, that form an endpoint in the data space in order to uh, perform trustworthy analytics on data from multiple sources, but then obeying of course and sticking to the rules and conditions that come from the individual data providers. Um, so we will have, let's say, a variety of, um, of different um, instantiations of the endpoints in such a data space, but the key message is that no one will be forced to, um, to go with a central data persistence um, or a data storage, in, a storage instance. Uh, you can do that if you want. There might be, let's say, economic reasons to aggregate data, and be, and for example, for analytics, but there is no must to do so. And that's, I think, the important message. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, now it's time for the lunch break. I know we received some further on questions, but we will assure you we will answer you the questions later on. Uh, after the summit, you will receive a message from us. So thank you very, very much again to Boris, Alban and Andreas. And see you later on, part, uh, part time, I think uh, Boris will join us again. And so ladies and gentlemen, please feel free also to use the time to meet and exchange with other participants during the lunch break now. And I'm looking forward to see you back at two o'clock. <laughs>